Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Applied Game Design. In this video, we're going to talk about how to make those applied games effective. So if you've ever made a game before, I'm sure you're aware of how much work it can be to make a game. So that's why whenever I start working on an applied game, I want to make sure that what I end up making will actually work. Now in a previous episode, I talked about how to balance the motivational aspects of a game with the applied goals of a game. In this episode, I'm going to take a closer look at the latter. And to make sure that a game will actually be effective, I have three simple methods. Number one is I do my homework. I look up research and I see if some of the findings in papers that I find on Google Scholar can be applied to the game that I'm working on. Number two, I look for design guidelines and rubrics. There's a lot of people who know so much about making applied games and they've made papers, videos, other kinds of publications and looking those up and learning from them is actually really helpful in improving the game that I'm working on. And number three, no matter how much research you end up doing beforehand, you're always going to have to play test it. There are always going to be some things that you did not foresee and if you really want to know if that game is going to work, you're going to have to test it. And those are my three methods. Let's look at the first one, research. Now, of course, I can't run you through the history of all the research that might be applicable to the applied game you're currently working on. So for this episode, I'm going to focus on transfer research. Now, transfer or transfer of learning is a concept from educational psychology that refers to the ability to apply what is learned in one context to another context. For example, it studies whether what you learned in your physics class is actually being applied when you try to build an actual bridge. Furthermore, it would study whether language skills that you picked up watching a foreign TV show with subtitles actually lead to you learning to speak that language, which is a funny side note since I actually became fluent in English as a kid because my parents had me watch way too much He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. But I digress. Transfer research is actually really relevant for applied game design, as we are often trying to translate in-game learning into real-life skills outside of the game. So let's have a look. What does the transfer research tell us that can help us to make our games better? Well, first we need to understand that there are multiple types of transfer. Near transfer, for example, means that the original context and the transfer context are very similar because there's a lot of overlap between them. Far transfer, on the other hand, means that the original context and the transfer context are dissimilar and don't have that much overlap. Now, if we look at the research, we'll find that near transfer is far more effective than far transfer, which shouldn't be too surprising if you remember the work of Thomas Malone. So let me give you a couple of examples of the higher efficiency of near transfer. For example, sports. Tennis and Batman are quite similar, so it would be near transfer and a lot of it would carry over between both sports. For example, the feel of hitting an object with a racket is present in both sports. Golf and volleyball, on the other hand, are more dissimilar and would be far transfer, so there's not that much carrying over, even if the rotational motion of a golf swing has a little bit of a resemblance to a volleyball swing. Similarly, skills picked up in a game carry over easier to games of the same genre. For instance, if you know how to play a deck builder, say paperback, it's easier to learn how to play other deck builders like Legendary or Dominion because it's near transfer. So the big question is then, do skills that you've picked up in a game transfer over outside of the game? For instance, does playing Civilization help you with a city management job? And would that be near transfer, far transfer or something in between? Well, I don't know the answer to that question, but if you're working on a game that uses the design principles of civilization to teach somebody to be a better manager, it's definitely something that you want to think about. In any case, another type of transfer is positive and negative transfer. So positive transfer is what happens when something you've learned in one context helps you to learn in another context. Negative transfer, on the other hand, is when something you've learned in one context actually hinders or delays learning in a transfer context. Now, this is not a binary situation by any means. Uh, let me show you an example of that. For example, German, English and Dutch are all Germanic languages. Now, if we consider near transfer, Dutch and German would be closer to each other than they would be to English. For instance, they're like siblings while English is more like a cousin. However, all three of these are a lot closer to each other than they would be to say a Romance language like French or a Sino-Tibetan one like Chinese. However, when we consider negative and positive transfer, there is a lot of positive transfer going on between the three. 
For instance, the word bed is pretty much the same in German, Dutch, and English. However, in French, it would be li, and according to Google Translate, in Chinese, it would be chuang. However, even if there is a lot of overlap between the Germanic languages that might increase the chances of positive transfer, there are also a lot of scenarios in which negative transfer could occur. For instance, a native English speaker would find it very strange if you would ask them to close the door by asking them, do the door shut? However, that would be exactly how you would put that sentence together in Dutch. Do the deur dicht. So sometimes what you've learned in one context can actually impede learning in another context. For example, if you've played a lot of racing games, you might think you're a very good race car driver. However, if you'd actually get to drive a race car, you might find out that there are a lot of things that you didn't foresee. Which brings me to another type of transfer, literal and figural transfer. Literal transfer is when what you have learned into one context directly applies to the transfer context. Figural transfer, on the other hand, means that only the general principles of what you learn in the original context might carry over to the next context. While a racing game might not set you up to be ready to be a great driver in real life, which is literal transfer, it could be successful at teaching you the general principles of, say, drifting a car, which would be figural transfer. Now that example can also be used to illustrate the last type of transfer that I wanted to discuss, low road and high road transfer. In low road transfer, what is learned in one context transfers over spontaneously to the transfer context. However, with high road transfer, there is some deliberate thought and some conscious process needed to transfer over information from one context to the next. So you might play a racing game a lot and never realize that you picked up how to deal with a car that loses traction on the road until all of a sudden you have to apply that when you actually find yourself in such a situation. If that were to happen to you, you have experienced low road transfer. Anyways, there's lots of ways to analyze how knowledge and skills transfer from one context to the next, but this is enough for now. At this point, I think we're ready to have a look at what transfer research has found, and I'm gonna sum that up in five quick points. Number one, understanding leads to better transfer than rote memorization. In general, you want your players to construct their own knowledge rather than presenting them with facts and asking them to internalize those. Like what I'm doing right now. Oh no. Well, sometimes it's actually more efficient to just tell people the facts and asking them to memorize them rather than having them construct all that knowledge on their own. After all, it's a lot of knowledge to construct. So in general, you want to look at what's reasonable and what is actually doable as a game designer when you're working on your game. Just keep in mind, if you can make your game so that people will develop knowledge on their own, it's better than asking them to memorize. And that actually brings us to number two, time matters. You might have heard somewhere that it takes about 10,000 hours to develop mastery at something. Well, the research on transfer actually backs that up. The more time you spend learning a topic, the more likely it is for transfer to occur. Number three, quality of instruction matters because the transfer research shows that transfer is more likely to happen when the instruction is sound. For example, you want to provide ample feedback, develop an abstract understanding of the materials amongst your learners by providing multiple contrasting cases, you want to provide a debriefing and a recap, and you want to relate to your learners' interests. Which brings me to number four, motivation matters. Now, I've discussed this at length, and there's even an episode devoted to it, but in a nutshell, offer reward systems, make your content as engaging as possible, and look for that ideal optimal challenge, and if you can, design everything around a social learning environment. Number five, metacognition. The research on transfer sees transfer happen more often when students are metacognitive. That means that they are thinking about their thinking. They're problem solving, learning how to learn, and they like it. So metacognitive students are aware that they are learning, how they are learning, and what they are learning. So you wanna try to make your students achieve that awareness as much as possible, without ruining your game. And that's the gist of transfer research and you can apply it to the games that you are working on. However, there is obviously far more research out there and I really recommend having a look at Google Scholar and seeing if there are other studies that might apply to what you're doing. The more research you do, the better equipped you are to make a game that will actually be effective at meeting its applied goals. Furthermore, it will also help you to can those ideas that have no chance of succeeding whatsoever, which is really helpful as well. Now, as you're looking for research on applied game design, you'll find that researchers have often gathered these findings into general guidelines or rubrics. And these can actually be very helpful as well. 
Personally, I like to use the Retain model, which was developed by Glenna Gunner, Robert Kenny, and Eric Vick at the University of Central Florida. Now the good news here is that if you've been paying attention to this video series, you already know most of it. I'll provide you with a link to the full rubric and the original paper in the description of this episode, but I'll do a quick overview first. So Retain is an acronym. Let me break that down. R, or Relevance, asks us whether or not the learning materials are presented in a way that is relevant to the learners. This is what I was referring to whenever I talked about building on prior knowledge or making sure that a game is motivating. For example, during the episode we did on constructivism. E means embedding, or is the learning content fully embedded in the fantasy content of the game? Again, we discussed this before in the episode on motivation and fantasy as endogenous fantasy and integrated game design. T or transfer, well, I really hope I don't have to explain that after the first part of this video. A means adaptation. Does the game ask that players adapt pre-existing or provided knowledge to new situations? That brings back the episode on design experiences and balanced progression, but also the episode on cognitivism when we discuss schema. I then refers to immersion. Does the game achieve higher levels of immersion? This relates to a number of episodes, for example the constructivist one. And finally, N or naturalization. Does the game lead to mastery of the learned content? We discussed mastery in a number of episodes, but in particular in the episode on motivation. And those are the six items of the rubric that we can use for applied game design. Now, all these items have four levels, going from zero being the lowest to three being the highest. And if you look at the download link, you can print your own copy of the rubric, make it like mine so it's double-sided and you save a tree. And you'll find the rubric items on there and the four levels for each of them. Now, how does it work? Well, let's use maybe immersion as an example. What does a game have to do to reach the highest level of immersion, according to the rubric? So, at level zero, the rubric reads, the game provides no progressive or formative feedback and there's little to no opportunity for reciprocal action. So, at this point, the game is not that interactive, it might as well be a video. However, if we move up to level one, the game presents some opportunity for a reciprocal action, it's meaningful, repeatable and interactive. However, players do not feel fully interactive in the learning yet. So we are getting some interaction, but maybe not the most immersive game yet. Let's say it's kind of like clicking on a link on a website or something like that. Level two then. In addition to everything I've already said, the rubric now also requires the game to involve the player physically, cognitively, psychologically, and emotionally in the game content. So at this point, we're talking about a pretty immersive, high quality video game experience. On to level three. Everything that has been said before still applies. But now the game also needs to provide the opportunity for belief creation. So that means that your beliefs might change by playing the game. And that's how the rubric works. You go from a game with no interaction whatsoever with a game that is so immersive that you can actually end up being a different person. Now if you look at the rubric in its entirety, you can score your game according to this table. Note that not all of the items are valued equally. Facilitating transfer or developing mastery or naturalization are valued higher than whether or not your game is relevant to your player or whether or not it immerses them properly, which is something you can calibrate a little to meet your needs. For example, as an applied game designer who grew up in classrooms that were far too boring, I value immersion a lot more than what you would think from looking at that table. In any case, let's have a look at an example of how this actually works and let's apply it to the game Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego? Carmen San Diego is an older game. It came with a world map and a travel guide with a lot of information about countries. In the game, you chase down a criminal and you use your geographical knowledge to figure out where the villain is hiding. This is how the authors of the Retain model evaluated it. Item 1. Relevance. There are elements of history and geography, but there's no connection to the player's personality. And players can get caught up in the characters and that might sidetrack them. So the result is... Level 1. Embedding. The very nature of the chase builds knowledge of world geography, and because the fantasy involves geography so much, players experience both as if they are one. So that means... Level 3. Transfer. The searching for clues has no application anywhere outside of the game series, but the visuals do allow learners to see geographical placement. So that means... Level 2. Adaptation. There is a timeline of information that includes information players already know, picked up through playing, and information that they don't know. However, the game does not require the player to construct any new ideas. It's all about memorization, which means... Level 2! Immersion. There's a definite sense of importance knowing that you are the detective tracking down Carmen. However, there is no creation of new beliefs or meaning about the topic matter. So that means... Level 2! Naturalization. 
The game features a wealthy spectrum of information for the player to utilize as they travel to various places, and the player constantly has to revisit that information. So in the end... Level 3! Now if you combine all those levels with the table that I showed you earlier, we can calculate a final score for where in the world is Carmen San Diego that you could use to compare it to other games. However, if you were to do that, you would end up with a score between 0 and 63, which is kind of difficult to work with. So in the rubric that I provided, I actually changed those point values so that you would end up with a score between 0 and 100, which is a lot easier to compare. So now that we've got that out of the way, we can calculate the final score for where in the world is Carmen San Diego, which would be... 80. And 80 is actually a pretty respectable number. I've had my students calculate the score for a number of games that they've played and we found that the average score that you would get on a rubric for an applied game is around 70. So a B in the applied game design course for Carmen San Diego is actually pretty solid. Well done Carmen. Anyways, now you know my second method to ensuring that my applied game will be effective and it's using a rubric. With that we can move on to the third method. And that's gonna be playtesting. Now I can't teach you in this video how to scientifically test the game because that's completely out of the scope of this video series even, but I can give you a couple of quick tips though. So while you're working on a game, you wanna test early and you wanna test often. As soon as you have a prototype, you can start testing, find some people to get some information from. Now, the first step in doing that is ensuring that whenever you bring somebody in to test your game with, that you make sure that they're absolutely comfortable and that they understand that you're there to test the game, not them. So any information that they can give you will help you. Now, once you've got that established, there's a lot that you can learn from. For example, how about you give them a test on the subject matter of your game before they play, and then you take another test after they're done playing. Did they learn anything? Also, you could try to interview them, ask them some questions about whether the game was motivational and if they felt that they were learning something. Or rather, while they're playing, observe them and ask them to describe their decision-making process. No matter what method you use, you'll find that there's so much information that you can gather, and by gathering all that information, you will manage to make your game more efficient and make sure that it works at meeting its applied goals. Well, Reggie, those Rubik's can be used to figure out how effective an educational game is. Kind of like a point system in a dog show, but you don't have to worry about that. You're perfect just the way you are. And that brings me to my final point, actually, because when you apply that kind of a rubric to your game, you'll probably find that there's a lot of things not perfect about it, but that's actually okay. If you can nail 80% of that rubric, you're already at the level of a Carmen San Diego style game. So try to do your best, but don't get lost too much into the details. And that's gonna be it for this episode. Here are the discussion points. See you next time.